Honor God this afternoon. Father, we, at times like this, Father, when we just experience you, then, um, then we just want to sit in your presence, actually, and we don't even need to do sermons, but Father God, we this afternoon want to honor you as the, um, the great I am, uh, the one that um, rules the universe, but also are so intimately involved with our lives. And uh, this afternoon we pray. This one, um, it's all of these um, stuff, but um, it's because we want to really just delve into, um, into these scriptures. We want to get into uh, what it represents, and I believe that you know, for a lot of us, it's strange that um, you know how God takes us as a group, you know, uh, collectively through seasons as well. And um, you know, um, the desert experience or the wilderness. Is one of those that are very blessed if you can take out of it what you um, need to take out of it. Um, if you don't want to move on without using it to its full potential. Um, but um, but it's all, not always so nice. But So this afternoon I'm going to just share again on that and I hope that it's really going to, um, to speak right into your heart. So Job 23 verse 8 to 10. Um, let me just recap a bit. Last week we spoke about the fact that the wilderness is a place where we ask the question, God, where are you? We also said that it's a lack of the tangible presence of God. Um, we said that it, uh, it feels like you are so far, so distant from God's promises in your life. And... Um, and yet, we know that God is still there. God promised that He's always um, there. And so in Job, we reach uh, the same experience that Job had at this time. Um, Job 23, verse 8 to 10, it says, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I do not perceive him. On the left hand, when he's working, I do not behold him. He turns to the right hand, but I do not see him. But he knows the way that I take when he has tried me. I shall come out as gold. And so we spoke about it last week as well, that you know, um, refined as gold means that you and I need to let the dross just um, surface under immense heat in order to get rid of it so that we can connect with God and that we can purify ourselves and get closer to, uh, to actually reflect God better um, and to experience Him more in our lives. And so God prepare us for, for seasons in our lives through the wilderness in order for us to be ready for the test that um, lies ahead. And we spoke about the fact that um, would it not be strange if our children and if we did not get tested through school even? Um, would there be any reason to learn anything or to uh, to grow in any aspect of life. Uh, and so we uh, spoke about spiritual maturity and that uh, going through the wilderness also helps us to get to that place where we are spiritually mature. And so our response toward the wilderness is either one of two things. Um, we either get tempted and in the process sin or we overcome. And um, and we, uh, we get more purified. And so sometimes we also give up because the season is just too long and, um, and we fall short and we will have to go through that test again. Um, and so the wilderness is not a pleasant experience, but it's the best place to grow. And, uh, and for us going through the wilderness, you know, we need to actually, and last time we said it as well, we need to endure in order to get to go through the purification process that God wants. Now let's get into uh, today's word, Isaiah 35, verse 1, and verse 8. So uh, the two verses um, out of Isaiah 35, verse 1 and 8. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice, and the blossom like the crocus. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. That's beautiful. So we call the way of holiness uh, like a path through the wilderness. 
The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall be belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. So there's a highway of holiness um, that goes through the desert, and uh, and we go to surf the, the the furnace in order to uh, to let these iniquities in our lives um, be sorted and that we can come close to God. Uh, in order to go through the intimacy process uh, for us, uh, we must also recognize that you know for me and my wife having a covenant relationship it means that I must be the greatest sin that I can commit to her is either emotional or sexual um, misconduct. The fact that even emotionally, if I attach myself to somebody else, it would be a gross sin toward the covenant relationship that we have between one another. And sometimes we forget that in the process of getting pure and dealing with the holy God that cannot get anything wrong, you and I sometimes are not faithful toward the covenant that we have with God. And so intimacy cannot happen if there are certain sins in our lives of disconnect between us and God. And so we need to know that nothing is better than the presence of God in our lives. I don't want to lose the intimacy with God and therefore I have to make myself a sin. You know, for me and my wife, it means that I don't want to lose her and the intimacy and the love between us, and so I'm faithful to her, emotionally, you know, in, in all um, spheres of life. Um, I'm committed to her. And the same with God. When we serve God, we commit ourselves in a very intimate relationship with Him, but it's not as if God wants to um, deal with our sins and deal with us and, you know, sort us out. It's the desire to come closer to God that leads us to sin. Place. And for that purification process to happen. But the only way that we can see that sin surfacing and uh, those blind spots in our lives happening or, or being uh, clear to us is we need to go through the furnace. We need to go through the furnace of the gold being refined. And so listen to uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 4 to 6. And I'm going to read a lot of scriptures today. Um, and it's going to really be a blessing. So uh, if you can, mark them down and uh, go through them afterwards. That will be amazing. Verse 4 of chapter 19. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. And how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. This is now God's people being brought to God himself. So God says that you have seen that I've... Um, dealt with the Egyptians, but I bore you on eagles' wings, and I've been protective over you all along. So God, as the intimate partner, you know, is the one that really reaches out to His people, and He's fully committed. Listen to verse five. It says, "Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey My voice and keep My covenant, you shall be My treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is Mine." And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. And so, um, God delivered the people of, um, of, of himself um, from Egypt. Now, Egypt, we also know, is the world for us. And, uh, and sometimes we forget that having an intimate relationship with God, we must choose to detach ourselves from the world. And the very same thing happened when, when, when our focus on God is more on what we can get from Him than His presence. Mm -hmm. And so many Christians commit themselves to God and they have this uh, relationship with God and they serve God for what God can give them. And so my question to you today is, you know, in this breakthrough you, you want in your walk with God, is it to see breakthrough in your circumstances or in your relationship with God? Because often I find myself at that place where the only reason why I'm more intimate with God is actually because I want to break from it in my physical circumstances. And many times I find myself at the place where, you know, 
I, I know that when I spend time with God, things are going better in my life. And so as I commit myself to more prayer time with God, more intimacy with Him, I actually see direct results in the physical realm around, uh, around me. And the very same mistake we make when we think that God always produces and therefore we serve Him um, rather than the presence. And so, when it gets to the wilderness, God allows us the opportunity to again turn back to Him and experience Him in an intimate relationship. And so, that's why you can see that Moses was more interested in a relationship with God than the promised land. <laughs> For Moses, it was not about Egypt or going back to Egypt. There was no ways that he would turn back because he knew the presence of God was the only thing that uh, counted in his mind. The very same thing happened in David's life. So you will see David going through the wilderness would spend a lot of time with God and so being in the wilderness before becoming the king and being anointed as the great king of Israel, David is quite content in being in the wilderness because God has raised him up as a shepherd boy in the wilderness to be prepared for the day when he would have the pain in his life. The challenge for us is that, you know, many times we forget that it's the presence of God that actually is our greatest reward. You know, the, the, the wilderness is not so that people have these big breakthroughs and that we have great success in life. It's actually the fact that it gives us the opportunity to draw closer to God in a very intimate relationship. And so, being passionate about His presence illuminates circumstances, stop the circumstances, or you can stay in the wilderness for the rest of your life. Exodus chapter 3 verse 3 says, And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned? And I want you to listen to the words Moses he said, I will turn aside to see the great sight. Why the bush is not burned. You know, it's, it's actually for me such an eye-opener to see that as Moses got his sight right on God and God's presence in his life, that moment of a burning bush and an intimate relationship with God, listen to God's response in verse 4. It says, When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, and he said to him, Here I am. Can you see the words there? It mm -hmm. says, When the Lord saw that he turned aside. Mm -hmm. When the Lord saw that Moses turned aside and focused on his presence, God could respond about the revelation of his life. And so it's those re revelation moments in our lives that carries us into the circumstances and all of the ups and downs in our lives. But if we don't turn aside and focus on God, and, and I don't know about you, but you know, it's those moments when you and I pray and we, you know, we set time apart for God and it just feels like you're not connecting with God, it feels like, uh, you know, God is so distant and yet... <laughs> You know, you're so committed, you fast, you pray, <laughs> you expect God to do uh, great things, and in the middle of that fast, you feel like, God, this is not even worth it, you know, you're not answering me. <laughs> and in the midst of all of this, God challenged us to the fact that when we push through, those are the most blessed moments. I don't know about you, but times in worship when I experience God the most is when I start to take control of my emotions and uh, you know those days that you really uh, feel like emotions. You can see, and especially you know, uh, when you see that other person like uh, Sophie getting so excited with God and you think, you know, where is he coming from, you know, and what the heaven is he because I feel like, uh, you know, I can't connect with God at all and he's just... Glory, glory, hallelujah. And in those moments, you stand there, you stand in front of God, you feel, oh, there's nothing happening. But in those moments when you push through, 
and you allow yourself and your emotions to, to channel your, your focus toward God, you start to experience His presence. And that changes everything. Because at that moment, you experience the greatest anointing upon your life. It's not so that those moments when you decide to sacrifice the flesh is the moments that you normally see that your biggest breakthrough is. Mm -hmm. And yet it is the time that you are really not into it. But it's a conscious decision to move into the presence of God. And so when, moment, when God saw Moses turning aside, he connected with him. Luke chapter 3 verse 2. Listen to this. During the high priesthood of Annas and uh, Sapphires, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah. Where? You saw with me. <laughs> it's too cold in this place, so much for me. In the wilderness. It's it's strange that you know in in all of this, um, John get this um, amazing revelation that his dad made a commitment to God as a priest serving in the house of God, and um, and here yeah, the angel comes to meet him and say that he will have, they will have a child, that this child will be very special. And, um, and this special child grows up, and uh, while there is great sacrifices in the temple, and I don't know why this piece of scripture, you know, leads us to actually first talk about, you know, the, the offerings in the temple, just to remind us that actually John, as a descendant of his dad, you know, was supposed to be in the temple or in the, um, the synagogue to also offer to God's people, you know, um, on behalf of God's people to God. And so that was the, uh, the natural inclination for a priest's son is to take over and to, to move into the same office. And yet John, in the midst of all of this, is led into the wilderness to have a Preparation from God. Are we more concerned about God not coming through for us or not hearing His voice? Galatians 1 verse 11 to 12 says, For I would have, I have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not a man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's in those moments when you and I push in that we actually receive the revelation of Jesus Christ. Galatians 1 verse 17, Nor did I go to up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So every one of God's big prophets and the big um, apostles had to go through the wilderness experience. And in this case, we know that uh, Paul was, you know, committed to go to Arabia. And some even said that as a, a Jewish um, uh, descendant, you know, uh, that uh, he actually went to Mount Sinai. That was the custom to go and meet with God, to, to, to consecrate himself as a vessel unto God in preparation for what God wanted to do. And so, the greatest purpose of the wilderness is that it's a place where God reveals Himself to us. And He draws us into a place where we can draw from the wells of provision that He has for our lives. So John 7, verse 37 um, to 39. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, and those who believe in him were to receive as you, yet the Spirit has not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So when it says here that um, in the places of, of dry land and of thirst, um, you know, we, we actually want to, to, to quench that thirst with the right thing. Um, we know that the wilderness is not the place of the alcohol. 
the wilderness is not the place where you experience a lot of the rain of God that falls on you. Um, because in the wilderness, you thirst. In the wilderness, you must decide where to go to in order to quench that thirst. And here in John, it's very, uh, very clear that God actually leads Jesus um, as the, the one who brings life in such a way that that intimacy leads us to let the living waters flow in our lives when we, in our desert experience, connect with Him and allow Him to uh, become more in our lives. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 18, verse 4 says, The word of a man's mouth are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. When we get to those times when we connect with God, rivers of living waters, the bubbling brook starts to rise within us. Mm -hmm. There's those moments when when you and I are in the wilderness experience and we cry out to God and you, you, you want to give up but you realize that something tells you, just keep on. Just keep on. Because I want to do it myself. And then that well starts to, to surface. And that well starts to become something beautiful in our lives. Proverbs 16, verse 22. Understanding it's a wellspring of life unto him that hath it, but the instruction of fools is folly. Proverbs 20 verse 5, the purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. And um, the wilderness is the place where you and I receive revelation from God. Now, I, you know, I remember years ago, um, that kind of persistence um, in my life uh, also surfaced. And I just want to say, the place of revelation um, for you and I in the, the wilderness is also the place where things are going worse before it gets better. The place where before you see the breakthrough, the greatest onslaught against the harvest in your life will happen. Because while going through the wilderness, you don't experience the reign of God all on you. But there's a still small voice within you know, that leads you with the revelation of, of who Jesus is in your life. And you delve so deep into the wells of provision that God has for your life that you actually get to, um, to hear His voice. And I, I remember years ago, um, you know, I, I think I've told the story here, but I'm not going to just mention it for those who uh, walking at 98, coming to the UK, and at that stage, you know, working as a security guard, you know, as any good South African uh, would do to get some um, pocket money to travel all over Europe and do those kind of tours. And um, I remember I, I went through quite a desert experience in my own life. Uh, at that stage, um, you know, I played rugby and my cornea burst and I couldn't finish my studies at um, uh, Stellenbosch University and, and um, at the time, you know, I had to make a plan. My dad just said to me, listen, you're not going to sit around. You better do something about this. You know, you're going to work off your um, study loan. And I just, in my own head, and maybe you know, it was one of those foolish things that I did um, out of my own, um, you know, will. But, um, but God worked it together for the good. Decided to come to, to the UK and at night time I would, I would actually be that desert experience because you must now remember, I'm at varsity, best days of your life, play rugby, you know, you get this um, injury. Um, I then had to come and work on this side as a security officer, you don't know the nation, you don't know the people, you, uh, you just own pounds, that's all that you do. And at that time, I would, um, in the middle of the night, you know, because I always did night shifts, um, and most of it was night shifts, some of my day shifts as well, but I would sit with my guitar, and I would just play worship music. And one of them was here in the YMCA, I remember so clearly. Um, it was actually crazy if I think back of now and what happened in those moments. I uh, walked through the corridors at night, you know, <laughs> and just played worship music. As I had control um, in the facility, 
I, uh, I allowed myself just to, to connect with God because that was the only thing that I had at the time. And as I did, you know, God would just dump all these, um, all these dreams that He had for my life into my lap. And, um, and it's strange that those moments, and, 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 and most of those stories is actually when we are young. And the reason for that is because you don't serve God for what you can get from Him, but really to seek His presence. Remember those times when we were sitting in the, in the worship experiences with God, and we sit there because nothing else matters. Mm. You know, you know you must actually go to study to get through your exams, but... Uh, Sitting in God's presence is much <laughs> nicer. But for those days, I remember, you know, were so special to me. And so many times I had the revelation from God because of the focus, attention to the detail that God wanted to do in my life. And for you and I, you know, the biggest challenge in moving through wilderness experiences is to really hear God's voice and to push through and to hear so that we will be. Sometimes we fall so short, and God's heart is actually to do so much more. And um, and this is the time when God not just imparted in my life, but I'll, I'll get back to the story later on. Uh, Numbers twenty one verse seventeen. That is the time when the joy of God just is at its best when His revelation comes to you. Numbers twenty one verse seventeen. The latter part of it says that Israel sang the song, Spring up a well, sing to it. You know, um, an intercession, I always, you know, it's so funny when we start the session and nobody's praying, we sit there and we've got praying. You know, there's uh, something going to happen tonight, and I'm the only one that now I'll have to delve. Is it just a pastor that experienced that? <laughs> <laughs> Lucky Serena sometimes will sit there as well. But you know those moments where you sit there and you think, okay, tonight it's just a dead thing. You know, nothing is happening. Uh, you know, nobody's responding, you're asking, is there any word? And nobody can a word. You know, it's really just a desert experience. And, um, and I find myself so often at that place where I then just allow myself and the rest of the group, I said, let's praise God for the character that He is in our lives, for His faithfulness, His commitment to us. And as you do it, you feel that well rise. And the whole climate would be the, that boring intercession become one of the wells of spring that uh, ends off with, we don't want to stop tonight, you know, we just want to go on. <laughs> To, we allow ourselves to, to face God and to allow Him to reveal Himself to us. Listen to Genesis chapter 26, verse 1. Uh, <laughs> Genesis chapter 26, verse 1 to 3. A severe famine now struck the land as it happened before in Abram's time. So Isaac remembered the descendant, the promise of God to, uh, to be the nation of God, moved to Gerar, where Abimelech, king of the uh, Philistines, lived. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt, but do as I tell you. Live here as a foreigner in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. I hereby confirm that I will give all these lands to you and your descendants, just as I solemnly, solemnly promised Abram, your father. Now, I want to just color in this picture. So, God's people, you know, through, uh, through um, Abram, now is one strong, and that is Isaac. <laughs> Isaac, the man that will carry the nation of Israel uh, forward, the one of promise, 
Now we know that Isaac gave up his life almost for this promise that God um, gave Abraham. But um, within this, God says that I will bless you. Now the greatest temptation for you and I in dry times is to return back to Egypt. Now this looks what, what is Egypt again? Can I just are you guys still with me? What is Egypt in my life? The world. And so the greatest temptation when we get that promise from God and we are in the dry land is to return back to Egypt to satisfy the needs that we have. And here for Isaac, it's very clear God has a promise for him. Um, and but he's in a very dry land and he must make a choice to believe God or not before this promise has come to fruition. Even though God gives the promise, there's certain actions even that he has to commit himself. And I'll get to that just now. The challenge for you and I is when we go through the wilderness is why do we satisfy our hunger with? Because in a modern day society, what we all know we will do is to actually go back to social media to get affirmation. Just to see how many likes did I get, uh, you know, on Facebook. <laughs> uh, because if somebody would just give me one heart, then, you know, I'm at least you know, at a place where I feel loved. Or we know how it goes. The hunger to eat more, the hunger to, uh, to have peace and lie in that path and um, experience a peaceful and light. Um, all of the things that actually, and for me, in the world, Rugby World Cup is there, you know, to look through all of the YouTube um, <laughs> um, responses. Even though you know that the reward is so great to go into the closet and just pray and experience God and the refreshing that you experience and the wells pushing up when you get there, it's the greatest thing that we resist. We would rather go to you know, all of those YouTube experiences, but Isaac had to do a certain action in order to, um, to, to take hold of the blessing of God. Now we also know that Isaac at this stage um, had to go and dig into the wells to actually get to the water and the provision that God wanted to give him. So even though he's here in this promised land of God, experiencing all of the promises of God, um, you know, as a promise, not yet an action, he had to go and dig those wells again because the Philistines actually covered the wells of his forefathers so that there was no provision in the land and that's why it was so dry. And in, in all of this, his side of the story was not to just wait from God to bring it to fruition, but actually to go to action and to dig into those wells so that God could be in the in his life. For you and I, if we want those blessings that God bestows upon us, and those promises that He um, speaks into our lives, we need to go to action and do whatever He um, has in store for us. Mm -hmm. But there are certain steps of obedience that is necessary from our side. Genesis chapter 26 verse 12 says, When Isaac planted his crops that year, he harvested a hundred times more grain than he planted, for the Lord blessed him. Because of his obedience, because of the revelation in the wilderness that he experienced, and remember, Isaac was not a man that was not tested. It's not as if Abram was strong enough to force him to get onto the altar when he had to be sacrificed. 
At that stage, his father was well over 100 years old. The only chance for, for him to actually get onto the altar and be sacrificed because God said so, was to willingly do so. Mm. Mm. He didn't give a word. <laughs> his father did. And yet he was obedient to, to death or willing to, to die. And, uh, and so God could trust him in circumstances of blessing. And so for, for you and I, we want the blessing, and surely, you know, the church so, so many times fall into the trap of the prosperity teaching. You know, all of us just want to be blessed, and whenever we are blessed, then God is with us. That's the challenge. In most Western churches today, people will say, when things are not going well with you, they would say to you, oh, we must pray that God's blessing will come back to your life. <laughs> which, is, which is good. The only challenge is that we measure God's presence and God's um, control in your life as only being blessed. As only, only when God bless you, He is with you. Mm -hmm. But the wilderness experience actually leads you to a place where Isaac did not just get hundredfold crops because he, you know, had a day was this amazing man that God thought, oh, I want to bless that man. He looks like uh, he needs a blessing. He was very faithful to all of the steps of the wilderness that he went through so that he could experience the blessing that God wanted for his life. And so, in those moments where you and I commit ourselves and endure through the wilderness, we get tested so that God can give it to, to um, who is faithful. Uh, is Isaiah chapter 12 verse 3 it says with joy you will drink deeply from the fountain of your salvation now one thing that I just want to mention today when we go through the wilderness you and I are not allowed to move <laughs> if there's one thing that disqualified the people of God to go into the promised land They were not satisfied. Because their expectation was almost rebelling against God in expectation that God would produce everything that was needed for them to get into the promised land. And God did. God gave them food, God gave them provision, He gave them even direction. And yet, in all of that, they were keeping on murmuring. And so, what I'm not saying today is that going through wilderness experiences don't allow you and I to go to throw our toys out of the cot with God. <laughs> because those moments are clear in Job's life, it's clear in um, all of God's people's lives. They, they, they could, David was especially good with us. Going and throwing his toys out of the cot and then he would repeat to God and say, God, you are not know, worthy. You, you, know, you are the great God. And, who am I to, uh, to, uh, to try to judge you? The challenge is that, you know, in going through a murmuring process in our lives, it's not helping us to get through the wilderness. Because it's finding the joy of the Lord that is the fountain of life in our lives that actually allows us to get through the wilderness. And so what do we practically do when we go through? Is what I've done when I walk through the, the, the corridors of um, the YMCA at that stage. Worshipping and praising God because of who He is. Because of His faithfulness. Because when your focus um, on God becomes more important than the memory in your life, you start to actually appreciate God for who He really is. A faithful God that really wants to be part of your life. And so, uh, Nehemiah. 8 verse 10 says, and that I'm using the latter part of that scripture, don't be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Eyes on the prize of Jesus. Um, and um, the greatest attack against your harvest is just before the harvest comes. But it's in the desert that you declare the promises of God. And, um, and not just the promises of God, you, um, you also declare the faithfulness of God over your life. Because when you look at God as being the faithful one in your life, um, you keep your eyes from your circumstances. And 
so lost there. I just want to keep working on it. I'm just saying. The challenge is, and, and I've, I've mentioned it so many times, is often we, we see the, the wilderness as a suffering experience. And I just want to be clear tonight that wilderness does not necessarily mean that you are suffering in a physical sense, which means that struggle financially or you struggle you know uh, physically the wilderness is in the absence of God where you are really experiencing even the greatest of um, blessings financially and <clears throat> but you don't have the presence of God and the purpose of God in your life I think there's many people that are well cared for and that's got everything that in a western society would look like a life of success and yet they still And so the wilderness is that place where you and I decide how long we want to be there. And we said it from the beginning. Is you can't shorten um, your, your wilderness. But you can definitely go on. <laughs> uh, you can definitely allow it to go on and on and on. And if you're Israel, you don't um, step out after a year. Because the wilderness was evident for them from the beginning. It was not as if they would go to, uh, to the promised land without going through the wilderness. But it was supposed to be only a year. As the spies went out, as they um, measured up against the expectations, and you know, they were murmuring about, and guess what? They had to go 40 years around the mountain. <laughs> now, I say that all the time, but I want to say it tonight. The problem with the wilderness experience is that it can become such a place of suffering because you are prolonging it the whole time that the 40 years becomes 80 years and 120 years. <laughs> we are not suffering freaks. God has not called us to suffer and to go through hardship. If we can be obedient and we can step out in faith and we can do whatever He wants and we can enter into that place of revelation of what He wants to change within our lives. We can move on. And we can experience the blessing that God actually wants to bestow upon our lives. Mm -hmm. You don't need to go through severe suffering in order to get God's voice. <laughs> you decide how close you want to get. And, and I want to just be honest, it's not as if God wants to, um, you know... Uh, be absent from you deliberately. God's desire is actually to be with you all the time, to be so close. And that's why you go through those moments, so that you draw closer, that you fight for what is really pure, and that is to focus on Him and Him alone. The only reason why we go through these wilderness experiences is because we're so distracted. Mm -hmm. Because we're so focused on things that is not really relevant in our lives. And God leads us to a place where again through the wilderness we can get purified and we ask ourselves, you know, why am I even entertaining this in my life? I want to get close to God because that is the presence. A presence in my life is the presence of God. And so, I mean more, really not. But um, in uh, Isaiah 43 verse 18, it says, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Mm -hmm. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. This is God's promise for you and I. <laughs> Listen to this again. It says, now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way, a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. First of all, it speaks about the former things. Now, we know what that means. It actually means the things that we're so used to, the way of doing, the, 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 the things that worked in the past. It says that there's a new thing, and sometimes we recognize even the, the, the new things, but most times we resist change in our lives, and we don't allow God to actually, through the revelation that He gives us in the wilderness, to step out and to move beyond and to be like Isaac and say, okay God, but if you say it's time to dig up the wells, then 
Let's do it so that we can move into this promised land. So we get stuck in the wilderness. And they said to him, the disciples of John fast often offer prayers. So do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. Which is now a, a challenge to Jesus. So, so it says that John the Baptist and his disciples are now fasting. And they're doing all kinds of you know, very religious things that is necessary to get closer to God. And they asked Jesus, so Jesus, but you, you guys, look, you are eating and drinking all the time. <laughs> Why are you not fasting and having better discipline in your lives uh, to, uh, to focus on, on, on what matters to, to get closer to God? The same version, and I just want to read this um, so that you guys can see uh, what it's all about. Matthew 9, verse 14. Uh, so it's just in Matthew's Gospel, uh, explaining a little bit better. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, which, which includes prayer, I think you all understand that fasting is actually about prayer, uh, but your disciples do not fast. <laughs> now, here's a key before we get to the, the new one. Is um, some seasons when you're in the wilderness, you need to really fast and pray. And give a lot of sacrifice in order to get to that place where you get to the revelation and intimacy with God. You really do. Hmm. But other seasons when the Son of God comes to this world and is present, why do you need to fast and pray when he's present and he's here with you? It's not to celebrate. And so not reading the seasons in your life can actually be to the detriment of your future. Because for us it's necessary to know that sometimes we're so fixed on what worked in the past. And yes, John, this man of God, this prophet, the Bible says that he was the greatest prophet of all times, mm -hmm. except Jesus. But it says that this great man of God is now actually offended. <laughs> because you know, even his disciples are not just giving up his priestly role and all the blessings that uh, could go with that. He went into the wilderness and he ate locusts. It says that they, they had very minimum lives of sacrifice and really just entering into a very committed lifestyle with God. Now, is that a noble thing to do? Yes, perfectly so. But you must understand that in the season that is called to prepare the way for the Messiah to come, there's a lot of prayer and a lot of sacrifice that needs to go and to happen. And so, in your life, sometimes you will have to sacrifice a lot, and you will, but don't become a suffering freak for the rest of your life. <laughs> and think that that's going to bring you closer to God. It will kill you. Because there's seasons where God just wants to bless you. And God just wants you to live life in the pool and experience the blessings. But while you are in the desert, make sure to apply the right things that is necessary for the desert experience. But... There's a way better place to be at when you get to the other side and get to the promises of God. But it will only happen through obedience. That place where you and I get the revelation of what Jesus wants to do in our lives and we step up and do what He wants us to do. And then the blessing comes. And that's why Luke chapter 5 verse 30 has said, and you know this scripture so well, it says, And no one puts new wine into old wine skin does, the new wine will burst the skins and it will spill and the skins will be destroyed. All of us agree that this is speaking about the wine being the Holy Spirit and the presence of God in our lives. Are we with? Mm. Oh, oh, do we all understand tonight? Mm. So if the new wine that God wants to pour into our, our lives uh, is necessary, it says that <laughs> The, the, the wine skins, let me just explain this maybe. Wine skins was um, sheep uh, skins that was actually um, prepared in such a way that it's very um, um, well, soft. And, um, and then they will pour up in the, the wine. And if the wine becomes old and, uh, you know, because of the uh, just the heat of the Middle East, 
um, those um, skins would be dry and it will not they will not be able to use it for the new wine to be poured in because it will crack. The only way for that skin to be used again is that it was actually rubbed in oil and they must prepare it again um, after you know it was the wine was poured out to be used again. And so when it sees that you cannot pour in old wines because it means that there's a preparation process of oil which you can go into a lot of reasons of what needs to happen in our lives in order to get to the next season. But I don't have time for that now. You and I need to be pliable for that new season to really happen in our lives. Otherwise, it's better, says the Bible. Listen to this. In verse 39 it says, and no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. So the problem with this is that if you and I receive the new wine with the old wine skin, we will burst. It says that actually we will destroy ourselves. But it's only when we are willing to be pliable and with and um, willing to, uh, to really go through the process of the wilderness and really apply new principles and a new thinking and a new understanding of what God wants for the season, that we are going to be uh, receiving the new wine. Because the new wine will be of no blessing if the wine skin is not changed. And so, my appeal to you this afternoon is, we cannot move into the promised land if we don't change the wine skin. And for each one of us, it, it's something different. For each one of us, the challenge lies within going to that place where we um, go and ask God, God, give me the revelation of what you want to purify in my life so that I will not stay the same. I want to change. But let me be open enough to discern the new season. so excited about what you want to do, but God, I, I realize that it's going to expose me to the core. It's going to expose me in such a way that I will have to make changes that is necessary for the new wine to be poured into my life. Us, this is our, this is probably the hardest thing. It's a transition from the desert into the promised land. A place where you and I need to make ourselves available. Sometimes it's very humiliating and sometimes, you know, it's really a humble, humble experience. But it's so blessed that we get to the other side. We can walk into the promises. And for John the Baptist, I guess, you know, the challenge was there, John? Yes. That was very noble. You will get your reward and everyone will pay. But Jesus is here. The promise is being fulfilled. The promise is busy getting to action here. Are you willing, John, to, to actually embrace what Jesus is busy doing? God says, if you want to stay rigid, stiff, unteachable, you should stay with the old wine. But the new wine needs flexibility of renewal or for renewal. I like uh, this uh, scripture to end off. Um, before I read it, Hebrews um, 10 verse 34 to 36, but it's uh, in the message version. Um, before I read it, but I just want to maybe <laughs> mention this. You know, you need to make a choice to be pliable um, before the test and the desert. Because it will be so right in the end of the day. <laughs> you must give God a dark blank check. And we've spoken a lot about it in this church. But if you don't give God that blank check to say, God, if you speak, I will listen and I will do. I will change. I will really do what it's necessary. Because the blind spot in our lives is the one where you and I will always have all kinds of excuses of not trying to purification, of not. this as well in, um, in the two um, times that we spoke about the wilderness. Let's 
guys. No, we can do the scripture first. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. Uh, but you, you need to stick it out like a staying with God's plan so that you'll be there for the promised completion. Some of you must maybe just take the scripture and put it on your fridge and do something about it. But you need to stick it out, staying with God's plan, so you'll be there for the promised completion. Father, we don't want to birth the Ishmael out of our desperation not to see you break through. We want to be obedient to you, to really see you do a thorough work within us. Mm. Oh, Father, Father, we. Change, Father God, that leads us to put the old things that worked in the past behind us and to embrace that which is new, fresh and blessed. Mm. Oh God, we, we're so committed to come closer. But we've got so many blind spots that we know needs to be revealed in the wilderness. But God, be so gracious us and so merciful to lead us to this with your mind to reveal to us Father what is necessary to change and to embrace your promise and to walk in faith. And Father tonight I want to pray in Jesus name. Let no one in this place get stuck in so committed to your presence more than the circumstances around us. Because being in your presence changes everything. Mm-hmm. And tonight in the name of Jesus I pray remove all of the dross that surface in seasons that we don't even expect it. Mm-hmm. So that we can deal with it. Father I know that's a difficult thing to ask. I know that Yes.